morning, everyone. It's another beautiful day. We've had some interesting weather the last couple of weeks, but now we're seeing a lot more sunshine, and we appreciate all that God gives us, the sunshine and the rain, and the good health and opportunity to be here and spend a little bit of time this morning focusing in on Jesus as the center of all that we are, you as an individual. He is at the center of all that flourishes in your heart and life, your family, and all that is great about your family, the source on the power of Jesus, and of course our church. And as a congregation, we're going to unite ourselves figuratively around a table, and we're going to sit there with Christ and partake of the same things that he implemented to remember him. And I just want to share with you a few things that can get us ready for that. I know you have your Bibles with you. I'd love for you to open them briefly to Matthew chapter 16. I want to tell you a little bit about both of the lessons today and how they came together. Our daily Bible read, which is posted on the back tables there, has had us in Matthew's gospel for three weeks or so. We're late in the game now. I think this morning was Matthew chapter 26. And so about a week or so ago, I was reading in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus warned against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, he said, watch out for it and beware of it. And he's very clear in verse 12 that a major problem against what Christ was trying to do is whatever the Pharisees were teaching and living. It was sort of the original false teaching of the Christian age. And so I got really interested in that, and I thought, what is that? What, what is this false teaching of the Pharisees? And instead of reading articles or writing down my own ideas, I thought, I think Matthew will probably tell us. So I went back through Matthew and looked at the way the Holy Spirit guided the words of Jesus, and I think this letter will tell you a great deal about attitudes we need to avoid, and that's what we're going to talk about in the, in the third session. We're going to look through Matthew, and we're going to try to figure out what is that leaven, and how do we keep the leaven of the Pharisees out of, out of this, this group, this work that we're doing. Well, a part of that journey was Matthew 12. So turn back just a few pages. Matthew chapter 12, we'll talk about it as one of our stories in a little while when we get to that section, but I think you know it well. This is where Jesus is going through the grain fields on the Sabbath with his disciples, and the disciples are taking pieces of grain and they're eating them. And verse 2, the Pharisees are watching and following, and they're looking for an opportunity, and they say, look, you know, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus goes on and explains some things about that that we'll look at later. But it was in that story that it just kind of hit me. The Pharisees were overall, and I, maybe I shouldn't categorize it this way, I feel fairly confident saying they were, they were pretty good people. They loved God. The Pharisees loved Yahweh God. The Pharisees feared Yahweh God. They loved the law. They loved to learn the law and follow the law and teach the law. Soundness of doctrine was a big deal to the Pharisees. And I'm not saying that setting them up for a fall. I'm not saying that to try to sideways insult them. Those are all positives about the Pharisees. The problem wasn't that they loved and feared God and loved and feared the law. The problem was they missed the most important part of all of it. Jesus. Jesus Christ is the center of all of it. He's the creator of all of it. He's the power behind all of it. And no love for God devoid of Jesus is real love for God. And no love for law is righteousness unless it is about that which Jesus is and does. And so I just want to show you that a little bit today. I have kind of an opening question for you. Is Jesus the center of everything that you are and do? Because if you miss Jesus, you can say that you love God and mean it. You can talk about fearing the wrath of God and feel it. You can talk about the need to study the Word of God and obey the Word of God and, and go to worship, and all of that will be good, and it won't matter at all if we miss who Jesus is. Can I just tell you that this building didn't save you. The Lord's Supper didn't save you. Worship didn't save you. Jesus saved you. 
And all of this is what grows out of our reverence and thankfulness for Christ. That's what they were missing. Overall, good intentions, big hole in the middle. And, and here's what's neat about that. Just back up a little bit to the song that we just sang together, and I've just put the quote up here. We know it really well. It's interesting to me that just before he gets into these Pharisees and their attitudes and what they're missing, he says these words that we know really, really well. We just sang these words. Jesus, here's who they missed. Here's who they should have started with. Come to me, Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Can I just make a few very simple observations? Right? What a beautiful thing. This has to be behind all of why you're here today, on how you're trying to raise your family, all of the other things, I don't think I've said anything this morning that said that, that fearing God is unimportant or obeying the, the word is unimportant. Or, no, it's not unimportant at all, but this has to be what's driving all of it. Here are four things. Just, I'm just drawing them right. These aren't complicated. They're just sort of me reading this section that you know really well and just coming away with some thoughts. Thought number one, he is calling every single person everywhere through any situation who is burdened and afflicted Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is a healer. Jesus takes broken things, broken people, broken families, broken churches, and he makes them whole. Jesus is a weightlifter. He is a burden bearer, and he is a helper. Jesus came to serve. He came to love. He came to give of himself to accomplish for us what we could not accomplish for ourselves. There is no one, religious or not, and it doesn't matter how not religious you are, and it doesn't matter how religious you are, there is no one anywhere on that spectrum in any place who does not need Jesus. I'm prayerful. I love our assembly. I love the Lindale Church. I thank God for you guys every day and write about you every Sunday morning, all good stuff. Love our fellowship. But this isn't just coming to church to do the right thing. This is coming to Jesus because he is the only thing. And this is the right way to show that to him. He's got the, the Pharisees just missed the centerpiece of all of it. He makes promises. He is the great healer and redeemer. And he promises relief for your weary soul. Don't you get tired. We're burdened. We're just worn out. Some of us have, upon the added burden of work and life and family and getting through all of everything, we have guilt, we have shame, we have embarrassment, we have sorrow. Some of us carry around doubts and fears. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden with all of those things. I will give you rest. I've been preaching half my life. I probably should have understood better, I, we're all growing along the way, how central this basic idea of faith is to everything else. He will give me rest, Psalm 23. He is the shepherd. He will comfort me and guide me and protect me, and he will do so for everyone. It's really cool, it's beautiful that every Sunday when we, when we come to the Lindell Fellowship, those who are saved in Christ exalt this idea that we, we have rest in him, but what's really cool is every week a visitor comes through the door. Someone who's not yet a Christian. Someone said, what's the deal with kind of like the 10, 15 minute gaps we have between our services in the morning? That's the deal. The deal is there are people going, I'm tired and my life is broken and there's no rest and they walk into this room and we don't go, well, church is the answer. Doing the right things is the answer. Baptism is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And that will lead you to baptism to unite with who? Jesus. It will lead you to worship to proclaim who? None other. He is 
the centerpiece and the wholeness of it. You go, that sounds really beautiful. The world should know that. Yes, you do need to know that, but there are a couple of other things you also need to know. He doesn't just come to us and say, I am the burden lifter. I am the answer. I can provide you rest. I can take your guilt away, your shame away, your embarrassment away, your fears away. He does promise all of that. But the method by which he promises it is this. Take my yoke upon you. Not a farmer. Was did not go to AM, do not, which means agriculture, something. I don't know that stuff. But I know basically what a yoke is. And a yoke isn't do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do. Yoke is when there are two creatures and there is a piece of wood placed upon them and they go together. And if one of them is dominant, one of them is larger, one of them is stronger, then where that one goes, the other one goes. They are yoked. Together, This isn't just some ascent of mine that goes, yes, Jesus, healer, savior, love you. This is, I yoke my life to you. Where you go, I go. What matters to you matters to me. The third thing along the way is he's asking you, he's telling you. I put asking in the original slide, change it. He's telling you. He's telling you. Take my yoke upon you. He wants and demands control. Do you know that? He demands control. And that's what this is in part. I mean, I hope you're here willingly. I hope you're here. Don't you like I hope you're here out of gratitude. I hope this is the number one place you'd want to be and you didn't care if a bunch of people were chasing you around with guns or what was going on. You're going to be here. But I'll tell you this. Even if it's not in your heart fueling your Sunday, demands worship. Is he allowed to do that? He demands it. He commands it. We yoke ourselves to him. To me, that is not bad news. It is awesome news. Because where he goes, I go. And it's more than just, I'll go a direction. I do think it's neat, we studied this before, that pretty much everything Jesus tells you to do, he did first, kind of in a yoke idea. He came to this earth and lived for God. He wants you to live for God. He was baptized. He commands you be baptized. But it's more than just, I'll show you where to go. It's, I will show you who to become. Putting Jesus in the center of your life is not just healing and protection and tell me what to do. It is shape who I am and tell me who I need to become. In our verse, he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. But then he says, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. He wants us to learn from him. Are you learning? I put that in last week's slides right in front of me. Like one of my only points last week was like, learn something. Like, I don't care. Anything you want. Just go out here going, I learned something. And I'm going to go work on that this week. How about this? Learn from Jesus. Learn what? Learn gentleness from Jesus. Learn humility. Well, Chris, why'd you pick those two things? I don't know. That I want you to be yoked to me, and I want you to carry like my, I'm a blessing to you, aren't I? Yes, you're a great blessing to me. Carry that blessing into the world to others. This is what he is offering. And if you think about it, we'll get into it in the third hour in a minute. It's not bad when we say third hour, but the third session is less than that. Like, look at that box. How much of that do the Pharisees miss? They go, no, but we, we believe in God, and God is our Father, and doctrine is important, and following. I know, I know, and all that's good. But only when all of this is beneath it, is pushing it forward, and comes from within. Now, the last thing, and I knew time would run short, but in chapter 12, after the incident with the Pharisees, which we'll talk about in a little while, he uses three greater than phrases. This is our main point. They, they miss the big thing. Don't miss the big thing, the biggest thing. But, and we'll do this really, really briefly, but how many of you know in, in Matthew chapter 12 the three things that Jesus said he is greater than? Three things that, that the Jews, that the Pharisees would say are pretty great, and they, they were, they were great. But the thing is, like, it doesn't matter how great they are to you, if he's not greater than those things to you, then those things no longer have value for you. Do you remember the three? Who could list right now? Just give me a, the three greater than not, here's an 
opportunity for me to do a little bit of marketing. Right? The first one is, he said, I'm greater than the temple. And, and this is where they're going, you, you can't, you know, you can't violate the Sabbath with eating this, this, the grain heads out of the fields. And, and Jesus brings up David and the house of God, which is very sacred, verse 4, to the Pharisees. And, and Sabbath and chapter 12, verse 5, the priests and the temple is all very important to get that right. Like the temple and what you did in the temple and what was lawful in the temple, all really, really big deal. But Jesus is basically saying the temple isn't here to save you. I am here to save you. Really, the principal point he's making here is I made that place. I rule. I am Lord of the whole Sabbath. You go, the Sabbath law says this. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, the temple rules are this. I made that thing. He is above all of those things. And this is where I go back to something I said a few minutes ago. Worship, obedience, the Lord's Supper, baptism, all important, but in and of themselves, not a one of them gave their life for you. They're not even people. Not a one of them has the power or heart to save you. The Lord's Supper doesn't save me. Jesus saves me. So I participate. Baptism of itself in water doesn't save me. Christ saves me, and I find the power of his death in the water. These are all pursuits of Jesus. So be careful with, I know I'm a Christian because I do the right temple thing. If you are a Christian, it is because in your heart, life, mind, and body, Jesus is the greatest thing that ever happened. Jonah did some really good things and led a whole nation out of sin, and yet Jesus is the resurrected and willing Savior who did so 
decidedly for us and gave his life. Solomon was rich and powerful and stepped in uh, an old adage, put his foot in a mud hole a lot. He, he fell into trouble a lot. He caused problems. He just never did any of that. He was just a benevolent, he is, pardon me, a benevolent king who says, I am ruler, I am victor over death. I'm working my way backwards. I made every single thing, and here's what I, the almighty, all-powerful, all-accomplished one, has to say to you. Come to me. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you believe that? Because that's what we're really about to remember. We're about to remember how far he went, how much it cost, how deep his love, how much further than Jonah, how much stronger than Solomon, how much greater than the temple he was, so that you can come to him. I almost feel like we need to put a little invitation between now and the Lord's Supper because you need to come to him and make it about him. Uh, last quick thing, I saw a little meme or something on social media. It was by a friend who I talked to about it and we're great, but he said, um, the, the meme said, in the end, the only thing that matters are the choices you've made. What do you think about that? In the end, the only thing that matters are the choices you've I get what he was saying. We text about it. He's a friend. I know what he means. He means your choices matter, and you need to be really careful with that. But here's my little thing about that. Like, I think what Jesus did matters, too. I think if it was just about all the decisions that I have made and what I have accomplished, and I would be in huge trouble. Look, your decisions do matter, and the decision you make today matters. But the decision that Jesus made matters more. It matters centrally. And from that comes all of the decisions. This friend of mine agrees with that too, but all of the decisions you make must emanate from the decision that he made. And then we obey. We obey with vigor in his honor. Are you ready to do that? He made a very important decision so that you could make great decisions in his honor. One of them is remembering him. Let's do that together.